Welcome back my friends to Mountain Blade 2 Bannerlord. In today's video I'm going to be explaining to you exactly how you can build up your very own army and kingdom. So for example, how can I get over 140 people into my party? How can I create other parties using companions that also have their own armies that roam around my ever-growing empire and help me capture other things, raid villages and wage war, and also bring these people into an even bigger army themselves, a proper army of 489 people, even more than that later on in the game. And the game doesn't really explain things like this to you, so I wanted to make a video explaining exactly how it works. So if we click on our clan tab, so essentially I'm going to be explaining to you guys how the whole system of the clan works and then we'll be going over the kingdom system and I'll talk to you about policies, how you can create an army and some of the other things that you'll find under the kingdom tab but I feel like it's most important that we start off in the clan tab because um, this is kind of where everyone starts the game. And by the way guys, all the timestamps for everything we talk about in this video are linked down below so you can find whatever I'm talking about as quick as possible um, because I don't want to waste your time. So starting off with the bare basics here, at the moment we are at clan tier 4. Now the more renown you have, the higher your clan tier will be. If you carry on earning renown by capturing castles, killing bandits, winning wars, even winning tournaments gets you renown as well. And there are different ways you can like farm renown and I'll leave my other guide in the description of useful tips for you in doing so. But essentially what you're going to be doing is leveling up your clan tier and as you level it up your party size will naturally increase. As you can see if I get to clan tier 5 it says here that my additional party size for every party in the clan will be plus 15 and I can also recruit an additional companion as well because you also have a companion limit. Now companions in Mountain Blade are really really useful. Now if you haven't already watched my companion video on where to find the best companions in the game I'll link it down below but essentially you're going to find companions with a different skill set. For example Chorig Frostbeard has a scouting skill of 85. It started off at 60 but he's leveled it up since. So if you go back to the clan menu and you click on Chorig Frostbeard you can see his clan role in the party is being a scout which means that we use his scouting skill as the party scouting ability. So as you guys can see I can see all the way over there because I have a scouting skill of 85 even though my own character has a scouting skill of 0. But as you start to build up your clan level one of the most useful things you can do is make another party especially when you have another kingdom. So for example all I need to do is click create party and then you need to have a spare companion. So Agna the shield maiden just here for example I'm going to select her to make a new party with and currently she only has herself as the party. So what we need to do is we need to find her and talk to her if we then talk to her you can say let me inspect your troops and then what I can do is I can give her all of my troops. So currently because I'm at clan tier 4 I can give her up to 81 troops. So now you can see she has a party of 43 troops herself. If we go back to the clan tab once again so as you can see at clan tier 4 I can have 3 additional parties. Each one of them has a troop cap of 82 so in total that's 246 people that I can have in addition to my own party okay. My own party has 274 people as the maximum amount I can have so in total we can raise an entire army of 520 people and I'll tell you how to do that in a moment. But first you're going to want to create separate parties of people and basically these separate parties are going to go around your lands and defend them. They're going to recruit additional troops, increase your influence and so on around the kingdom. If you also go back to the clan tab and you hover over your finance menu you will see that Agna the shield maiden for example has earned us plus 1582 gold from attacking enemy caravans, raiding local villages and so on. And also Apsi the robber and Furhand have both earned around 500 gold. And I've seen these fluctuate in between them earning 200 to 2000 gold depending on who you're at war at and what they're doing in the countryside. So companions having their own parties 
while you're at war can make you a lot of money. Even more money than workshops and caravans that I showed you in uh, my other video explaining how trade and caravans work, which are also linked down below. I've literally done a guide on everything to do with Mountain Blade. But as you can see, Apsi the Robber has a rogue skill of 60. So if we let him form his own party, he's going to be running around, robbing other villagers and making lots of money for us. You also see under the clan tab that you have your caravans, and the local garrisons of your different castles and cities that you own. And then you also have the fiefs tab, and this basically allows you to click on the different castles and villages you own and see if they're all happy with you, if any of them hate you, and you know what their current situation is and so on. And it just allows you to manage them easier. You can also see uh, their total income if you look on the finance section just here as well. And you can even change the governor from this tab as well. You also have a other tab which is going to show you which workshops you own and how much money they're making for you. And you can also change production of what they're making as well from this tab. If you guys don't understand workshops and how to make the most amount of money, um, check out my other video guide on how exactly to do that. I will link it down below. But now let's have a look at our kingdom tab. Now, the thing is, is that I actually own my own kingdom. So this is the Battleborn Kingdom. And as you can see, I am currently the only clan in my own kingdom. I can recruit other clans to my kingdom if I want, but currently I'm not doing it. And I'll explain why in a moment. If you join another faction's kingdom, for example, we used to be in the Valadian Kingdom, you would see all of the different clans that are a member of that kingdom just here. And by the way, I forgot to mention this, but if you want to build your own kingdom, you have to do the main quest in the game, which is the quest called Neratezza's Folly. You then need to do a quest called Rebuilding the Banner or something like that, which follows on from that quest. I'll link a walkthrough on how to do Neratezza's Folly in the description below, and that follows on to another walkthrough of essentially how to build your own kingdom. It's quite straightforward, but that video just kind of shows you the fastest way of completing that quest if you're really keen on going down that path. You can also see everything that your kingdom currently owns and how many people are defending each thing. But what I want to talk to you guys about is the policy tab. Because as you guys can see, there are some policies in here that will massively benefit your kingdom. For example, Sacred Majesty. The ruler is considered semi-divine and certain rituals are to be performed in his or her presence, increasing his or her air of authority. So essentially this gives my ruler's clan, which is my own clan, the only clan in the kingdom, five more influence per day and then non-ruling clans would lose one influence per day. Now because we have no other clans in our kingdom, if I go ahead and propose this, it will automatically go through and it says that this decision had the support of the council, which is just myself because I run a dictatorship, obviously. Um, and now that's gone through into our active policies. Some of these policies are absolutely incredibly powerful. For example, you can grow your party size by double with the Royal Guard policy. The ruler maintains a prestigious guard force. It attracts warriors who might otherwise serve their local lord. Ruler's party size is increased by 80. That is literally double the size of a party you get for literally having your own kingdom. All you need is 50 influence and you can just propose this for your own kingdom and you double your party size. You also get an additional one influence per day and non-ruling clans lose 0.2 influence per day, which again, really doesn't matter. Another thing is nobles retinue. What this does is clans with tier 4 clans or above gain one influence per day and the party size of their leaders is increased by another 50. So we already have a massive party size now just by using a little bit of influence to activate these policies that most people watching these videos who are new to this game don't actually know about. So I wanted to point them out to you. Another really good one though is land grants for veterans. The distribution of lands to veterans was a key platform of the Roman populace such as Marius and Caesar. The presence of veterans in farming communities helps with organised militants. 
So if you have this policy, military quality will be increased by 10%. The negative side is that village tax income is reduced by 5%. Currently, as you guys can see, I've got like 372,000 gold because I'm at war with Sturgia and we make all of our money through war and a tiny bit through trade. So village tax isn't important to me, whereas recruiting really good warriors is. So this is really good for me personally. So for example, if I recruit troops from one of my local villagers here, you can see they've actually got Sturgeon warriors and not just crappy Sturgeon recruits. So they've actually increased the quality of these men that we can recruit from them. And this village as well also has some veteran soldiers. And if you're really good friends with the village, you'll actually be able to recruit some of their best men as well. But currently we're, we're not that friendly with them. They'll have to love us to do that. Another one that's a no-brainer is Castle Charters. Castle upgrade costs are reduced by 20%. That is massive. That is so cheap. And castle owners will also yield one additional influence point per day. So you just get free influence points. Like, I mean, this isn't negative for anyone. Why would you not choose these policies? There are some policies in here that obviously have negative effects. For example, state monopolies. Rulers clan gains 5% of settlement tax per town which is really good if you have other clans in your kingdom, but it also reduces the workshop production by 10%. So it can be counterproductive in many ways too. So there are some policies you'll need to use your head about if they work for you. There are other policies where, you know, it's just a no brainer. Like why would you not? Okay, so we've gone over policies. Now let's talk about creating an army. So as you guys can see, if I press create army, my free parties that I showed you how to make in the clan tier can all be added to my army that I'm about to make like so. And you'll notice it costs me zero influence points to recruit these people because they're my own companions. If you are in a like another kingdom that you don't own, it will cost you influence points to tell another commander to come to you and join your army so you can go and raid some villages or something. So do bear that in mind. But this is one of the advantages of having your own kingdom. Another thing you'll see here is that it says the distance away that your companions are. So as soon as I activate this, it's gonna take Apsi the Robber two days and 11 hours to actually reach me. So you might wanna plan around how far people are away from you before you go and make an army. So we're going to say done and as you can see all of these people are now going to be in my army and they're all going to be walking towards me. So here I am in the middle of nowhere. I'm going to walk over to Balgrad and I'm going to um, recruit some more people while we wait. So here we go. Here is Agna the Shield Maiden. Um, so as soon as she gets close to me she's just going to go ahead and join my party and now it becomes an army you know. So we're just waiting for another two of my followers to to arrive and uh, our army will get even bigger. So I'm just going to wait at my local castle for everyone else to show up. And what I recommend doing is talking to your followers. And then you can say, let me inspect your troops. And currently you can see Agna, the Shield Maiden's party, is 44 plus 4 wounded out of 81. So she can have a lot more people in her party. So let's go ahead and make sure that she has a full force of troops. So now she has a full 81 troop limit. If you make sure all of your companions are at their troop limit, then you know that you're going to have a fully forged army. So as you guys can see, the whole army has formed here. We have 489 men in total. You can see on the bottom right, everyone is now in the army. However, Furhan doesn't have a full party. So we can actually go ahead and talk to him and we can say, I want to give you some more troops. Um, and then we can go ahead and make sure he's at the full strength of his party. So now we have 490 men. We're almost at 500. So let's say, for example, I know that I want to take this local castle, but I'm already at my maximum army limit. One thing I can do is I can go and manage my garrison at a local castle, which I know have, has a lot of people. And then I can add all of these people into my party. So now I have a whole army of 330 but it's over my party limit so essentially what this means is between three and five people each day are going to just abandon your army and leave so it's not recommended but you can definitely do it if you just need the extra men for an attack on the enemy 
But now we have a full army of 500 people. That is essentially how you make it. Let's go and have a giant siege battle at the end of the video. Another thing you guys can check out on the uh, Kingdom Tam is diplomacy. This essentially shows you who you're at war with, who you're at peace with, and you can see uh, their power compared to yours um, and look how weak my tiny kingdom is. Though we are at war with Sturgia and we are slowly crushing them. So that's pretty cool. So let's say, for example, you've made your entire army. You can then go and click on the Manage tab. What you can do with this is you can remove people from your army if they need to go somewhere else and help you out elsewhere in your land. Or you can even click here to disband your entire army and let everyone leave it. So now we're going to march north and we're going to lay siege to this castle just for fun. I'm going to ignore the enemy armies because they're not really going to be able to do anything. I'm going to go ahead and besiege this town and build ourselves... Um, a battering ram and some siege towers like so. So you also notice as you guys are leading your army that your leadership skill, mine's currently 60, is going to be increasing. Because as you can see, if you maintain a high morale in your party and assemble and lead armies, it will continuously go up. You can also see here on the right when you're organizing these huge forces that your army has a cohesion of 85. So if you have a huge army, its cohesion is gradually going to reduce. So because of the army size and its base size, it gets minus three per day. Once the army cohesion reaches zero, the army will disband. If you also hover over the food icon just here, it will tell you that we have a total amount of food in our army of 494. We have a daily food consumption of minus 26, so we have 19 days until our army is starving, essentially. Um, you can also see that the parties held in the army as well, and who is owning each one of those parties. You can talk to them, or you can even look at their stats in the encyclopedia. You can also see down here what your movement speed is, your view distance, and your daily party wage as well. So we're losing 1,000 gold by having all these men in our party, um, you know, sieging this castle. So you really want to plan your assaults and tactics um, well when you're doing this. Okay, so we're now ready to lead the assault. So obviously we're going to go ahead and do that with our huge, absolutely colossal army. Now you guys can watch this giant siege if you like with... 500 people attacking a castle of I think about 300 or so defenders but essentially that is it for the tutorial part of the video if you guys have any useful tips or comments about your own experiences please do comment them below because it helps other people out watching the video who might have questions as well and I've made a guide on literally every principle of Mountain Blade and how it works so you can find those other guides in the description below in the playlist so if you want to check those out they're all down below in the description and I'll be making a lot more too. So make sure you subscribe and press the bell icon for those future videos when they come out. But now let's begin the assault, brothers. I'm going to get off my horse. I don't know why I brought it into battle, to be honest. By the way, if you do bring a spear into battle, it actually gives you a uh, plus um, morale. So it's it's pretty beneficial. How is this? There's like, there's like two men pushing this entire siege engine. Yeah, that's right, you lazy boy. Why don't you get on it and help too? So we can probably take out some of these archers from a distance just up there. My goodness. Let's get behind the siege wall here and see if we can uh, do some damage. The last castle I took in my um, in my campaign was actually quite funny because um, we I ended up getting hit by, I think it was like a trebuchet or something. So I just took like 300 damage, that damage at the start of the battle and died instantly. As you guys can see, our... Uh, battering ram has already been destroyed usually it's the siege towers that are uh, you know do the best and make it over to the enemy so i recommend using as many siege towers as you can am i just terrible at archery there we go 31 damage nice the sieges are still a little bit buggy i found but um they're getting better as um tail worlds oh my god look at all the arrows that are sticking out of their shields as Tail Worlds patches the game, they are getting a lot better. I can see him aiming at me. Correct, son. I need another man to take over pushing this. While I try and protect you all from the 1,000 archers shooting you. Correct, son. Look at that. Beautiful. 
Oh, beautiful. Look at that. God damn. They're absolutely destroying them. We might want to start shooting some of these guys who are going to try and take us out as soon as we uh, start attacking them in a moment, though. Okay, I could go back and collect some arrows from the ground, but I think what we're going to do is stick around here. Right, the men are starting to walk up, so I'm going to walk up with them uh, just to increase their morale. The other siege engine is going around to the side. That area is actually a lot easier to attack if you haven't attacked this castle before. The majority of their forces are going to be at the main gate right here. Let's see if we can take people out behind here. We want our men to get up this ladder. Goodness me. There's a lot of men here. I'm going to sit on the ladder and poke them. And poke at their feet. There we go. Get wrecked, son. Sorry about the FPS, by the way. The, the game is super badly optimized. Honestly, if you just sit at the top of the ladder with a spear and just poke their feet, you're actually like quite defensible. I'm going to grab a shield in a moment. I just kind of want to poke over the heads of my troops here to do some damage like so as you guys can see we are on realistic difficulty by the way uh, just to let you guys know um, everything's on realistic so yeah if the men coming towards you just get down the ladder and poke their feet if you can. it seems to be very effective hell yeah look at this first person perspective just look brutal pokey pokey right I think I might grab a shield from uh, the floor here can I pick this shield up Get Rex up. Yeet. Doing quite a bit of damage back here. It's kind of hard to actually see where the enemies are with the... Uh... Oh dear, there's so many of them. Let's go ahead and equip a two-handed axe. And as soon as I get the opportunity, we're going to come up this ladder and just swing, swing, swing. Look at that. Absolutely brutal. Oh, mate, 109 damage. That is grim. We're going to sit at the back here. We're almost dead ourselves. This is brutal. Okay, now might be a good time. We're slowly depleting the their, their, uh, their enemy, though. Get Rex, son. I can hardly swing my axe around here. It's so big. Oh, we got hit by an arrow. That's so sad. My forces are very slowly working their way up the wall, though. And if we have a look... Oh, on the other side of the castle, as you can see, my other siege tower has completely breached their walls. So the rest of the men are now charging in, all heading up that siege tower. Unfortunately, our battering ram didn't actually make it in the end, but if it did, we would be able to flank behind all these soldiers and we wouldn't be attacking them in one tiny corridor here. But guys, I want to thank you so much for watching if you did stay to the end of the video. And if you want to follow along with my main playthrough and campaign, where we're actually going to do a siege battle like this very soon, uh, please go ahead and watch my videos. Um, I'll link the playlist down below in the description. But thanks for watching, thanks for all the likes, and I'll see you in the next guide. Goodbye!